Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me um, well. Thank you for uh, joining uh, tonight's uh, lecture. Um, I'm Dermot O'Hara, I'm a Senior Research Fellow of the College and a Research Professor in uh, the Chemistry Department. And we're coming live from, from Chemistry tonight. Um, next to me, you've got tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Steve Freilich, and I will just give a you a few words of uh, introduction to Steve and, and then hand over, over to him. So um, he is the college's 2023-24 uh, 20, uh, Oliver Smithies Visiting Fellow. Um, almost exactly a year I proposed to the uh, governing body that he should be elected to this uh, post. And I am delighted to obviously say now that this was received warmly and unanimously, uh, although you may think not the traditional uh, fellow that a college like Balliol um, except and think he, you are a pioneer, in fact, having coming from the world, corporate world, the world that many of you know uh, uh, very well. So, um, and, and so this will be a new and exciting lecture, maybe that we have never uh, experienced before. And I'm I personally looking, looking forward to hearing uh, Steve tonight. So those of you who may not know, he uh, graduated as a PhD from Harvard and then uh, joined DuPont, uh, having a very distinguished uh, career uh, there, um, re retired uh, recently as Director of Material Science and Engineering from DuPont C&D in Wilmington, uh, Delaware, a post that he held for, for 12 years. Uh, and during that time, he also was the Chief Technology Officer of DuPont's Electronics and uh, Communications business. And um, so um, without further uh, ado, uh, Steve, I'm going to move out of the way and let you take center stage uh, to give your uh, lecture tonight, Stupid Money and Innovation, a Rational Approach to Industrial Research. Over to you. Thanks, Dermot. Allow me to shift my location a tad and share my screen. As Dermot said, I, I spent the last 12 years of my career as the director of material science. Um, and in that time, combined with the 33 total years that I spent at DuPont, including running businesses, I thought I understood what research was supposed to do. And, and I'm, I'm sure most of you believe the same thing, that you, you think that, as I did, that research's goal was to discover the next great thing. Um, but in all of that time, I made a lot of mistakes, the largest of which was realizing that, taking too long to realize that that is in fact the wrong answer. The goal of research actually is to spend as little stupid money as possible for the corporation. In other words, leading the corporation to know when it should stop doing something or when it should double down. Now, that seems like an obvious thing. Why would anybody spend stupid money? Uh, well, let me first define it for you. Stupid money is money that you spend knowing at the time you spend it that you probably shouldn't be. And again, it seems kind of obvious, uh, but in fact, we do it all ourselves in our, in our own lives, largely because of poor impulse control. And you would hope that when corporate leaders are spending somebody else's money, that they are uh, more rigorous in their thinking than that. But it turns out that corporate leaders have a lot of other reasons to spend stupid money that allows them to fail the organization in this test. Some of those are listed here, management hubris, overcommitment to an idea that's just not going to work, poor governance processes, often that are um, poorly designed to know when it's appropriate to stop a project, that includes things like, what am I going to tell the shareholders we're doing instead? And how do I explain the sunk investment that I have? But in addition to those, I think one of the key reasons for this failure is confusion about what innovation really is in a corporate setting. So let me give you a few thoughts on, on that topic. And this is what we're going to talk about for the rest of, of our, our time here. Um, the first of these is that 
Invention is not the same thing as innovation. The next is that you need new input in order to innovate. Third, you'll spend less stupid money when you innovate from your strengths. And uh, fourth, you need a strategic foundation on which to innovate, because let's face it, a good idea today may turn out to be tomorrow's stupid money. And finally, every product that has ever been introduced into the marketplace is replacing something that already exists in that application. And if you do not recognize that, you are in fact going to be spending an awful lot of stupid money. So let's talk about the first one, that invention is not the same thing as innovation. Now, pardon me, I'm just moving some of these tiles out of the way. Um, invention is something that happens in an instant. Often it's something that is done by R&D, but are all inventions innovations? Let me give you a rather silly example to make the point. This is work by uh, the American cartoonist Rube Goldberg, who was active from 1908 until he retired in 1963. And he would weekly come up with these cartoons of complicated efforts to do relatively simple things. They became so ubiquitous that they have been phrased as Goldberg machines. And here you see one of his uh, uh, famous examples of a man who's developed a device to clean his mustache after eating a, a, a bowl of soup. And there's no doubt in my mind that this device would work. People have actually built the Goldberg machines and proven it. But while it's unquestionably an invention, is it an innovation? And I think all of us intuitively would say, no, it really isn't because nobody's actually going to use this. And I also feel, while I can't see you, that some of you are rolling your eyes out there in, in, in um, internet land saying, well, of course, it's a cartoon, it's silly. But let me draw your attention to something in the patent literature of which there are thousands, which is a, another invention that actually has been delivered with a patent in 1896 for a self-doffing -doff hat. Now, the inventor of this device believed that he had something that people needed. And um, he, he not only wrote the, the patent, probably paid a patent agent to submit it, paid the maintenance and, and the filing fees. And in those days, you also had to have a working prototype to prove that this thing was, was functioning but I'm sure he never uh, sold more to anybody than his friends and family. And so I think what we can say is that the difference between an invention and an innovation is that an innovation is something that only takes place in the marketplace, often through the intersection of a number of business processes that create value for the people who are being convinced to buy it. So that's really what we need to focus on with the concept of innovation. And it can take a lot of forms because now we're dealing with a lot of different functions in a business. It can be, in fact, a unique invention that creates a, a, a novel material. It could be a unique manufacturing solution that dramatically changes the quality or reduces um, the, the cost of something. It could be unique value chain solutions or even unique business and legal uh, uh, ideas that then create value for the customer. I've thought about how can you begin to understand leading indicators for innovation? Because if you could develop something like that, you'd be able to know where to put your money very early. The problem is after 20 years of looking for these and working with uh, people who are innovation experts all over the world, I have never been able to find them. But the one truism that I was able to uncover is that without doubt, the first step of an in innovation re uh, remains the acquisition of new information. Nobody ever woke up in the morning and said, today I'm going to innovate, or sat down with a blank, blank piece of paper and came up with an innovation. It was the result of some new information that comes in, usually through acquisitions, or sorry, not through acquisitions, through, through collaborations. And those collaborations, while they're Manyfold are not very easy, and there are a lot of factors. Now, I'm going to do something here that I apologize for, 
I'm going to show you an equation. I promise you this is the only equation in this presentation. And those of you who have taken uh, first year chemistry will actually recognize this equation as the famous Arrhenius equation that uh, determines bond breaking as a function of temperature and rates of chemical reactions. I've taken this equation and recognized that it actually can be utilized in understanding uh, the process of collaboration. And because I've redefined every one of these terms, I have arrogantly called this the Freilich equation. And the Freilich equation says that innovation potential, that is how likely an interaction is to lead to an innovation is a function of all of the barriers that get in our way of collaboration. And we, we can think of, of many of these ourselves through our own experiences, their fear of, of giving away information, there's not having enough time, there's an arrogance of, of class and status, focus, et cetera, and things, things that uh, are listed here among others. In order to overcome that, we need to see the mutual intensity of the opportunity. How good an opportunity might this be? as described by the, by the leader in this interaction. And how is this going to take care of the need that's been identified? We also need to have information that's complementary. If all of us know the same thing, it doesn't really help us because we're not actually acquiring the new information. And finally, this prefactor talks about how often and how close we are in our networking. And while I've been using this equation to try to quantify innovation for a number of years, I was actually always suspicious about this prefactor until just a couple of months ago when there was an article published, um, uh, I think this was in November, where they were able to show through measures that they have of relative probability of either a pa paper or a patent being disruptive, where disruptive I will substitute as uh, another word for innovative. And what they found is that when uh, the, the, the uh, people working together were vicinal, when their offices were very close to each other, that there was a much higher and statistically meaningful difference in the probability of that work being disruptive than even if they were close in the same time zone, but not co-located. And finally, significantly more than if they were um, in different time zones. Now this is for disruption. It's a different answer if really what we're looking at is, um, it is follow on application. Now, one of the things that I found ironic in this particular paper is that there were a series of author authors, some of whom were at University of Pittsburgh and some of whom were at Oxford. So, you know, they started out uh, knowing that they were not going to be developing something that was particularly disruptive, but I found it very useful. It is nice to be able to have a strategy that says we're going to work together and we're going to organize ourselves to be able to work together. But as somebody said, and I don't know who said it, but I can assure you it was not Peter Drucker to whom it has been attributed, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And much to my disappointment, something has been happening in the culture of late. We look at here at some work that was uh, done over many years by Ashish Arora at Duke University Business School, where he looked at thousands of companies and uh, their R&D spend and what the output of that spend was, either in terms of patents, which he uh, attributed through some metrics of his as being development work or publications that he attributed to being research work. So he's saying here is a separation of research and development and research is going down while development is going up. And meanwhile, R&D intensity, which means R&D is a percent of sales, which by the way, is one of the most ubiquitous measurements of R&D spending. And it's also one of the silliest, which if anybody wants to understand my opinion on that, I'd be happy to give it to them. Um, but R&D intensity over this period of time has at worst stayed flat and mostly has increased. So his conclusion is that research is going down, 
development is going up and we're getting less impactful work and therefore less innovation. And this is happening across a range of different industries. And while these are US companies, data that uh, he has also followed since this publication show that the same thing is happening in European and UK companies. What I find most disturbing is another piece of data from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, where they looked at publications in common sets of journals, here the IEEE publications, of the most important uh, central research labs where the greatest innovations have come from, specifically Bell Labs, uh, IBM, which by the way is 100 years old this month, uh, DuPont, and General Electric, and look at the publication record as a function of time for these organizations. It's quite a disturbing uh, message that comes out. So even for these storied research organizations, what we find is we've got ourselves a world of problem here. So why is this happening? Well, in the spring, I'll be giving another Oliver Smithies lecture, hopefully, and I, I'm, I'm hoping also that the topic of that is a further diving into understanding what's going on here, what's driving corporate decisions to look like this. But I also think there's something in the history of science that's important for us to take note of. Um, towards the waning days, waning months of uh, World War II, Franklin Roosevelt and his uh, science and defense advisors recognized that they had largely been successful in uh, winning the war not so much as a result of brilliant planning and, uh, and, and ex extremely good utilization of uh, men and materiel, but it had been the ability to take basic science, science that was developed with very little uh, implication at the time of its practical implications, and it had utilized those in entirely new and important applications to change the course of the war. Roosevelt understood that this is a way also to grow uh, an economy. And so he asked Vannevar Bush, who was his prime science advisor, to study this. And Bush, uh, after Roosevelt's death, produced a report called Science, the Endless Frontier. And out of that, there were two things that I've been able to, to gather from the report. The first is the comment that I made earlier that basic science is performed without thought of practical uh, application, but also that insulating basic science so that there isn't this constant pull to apply is important in order to make the research more powerful and ultimately more useful. So he believed that separation of research from development was critical. I think in part what he was worried about was a Gresham's law of R&D, Gresham law being a monetary theory that says that um, bad money will squeeze good money out of the market. Here, in my vernacular, bad money being development and good money being research. That if development squeezes out research, you end up with less good research to build the future developments on. So Bush was hoping for a linear transition from basic to applied where you could draw a line. And in order to, to make that line as powerful as possible, he recommended the creation of the National Science Foundation and strengthen the National Institute of Health, and the rest is history. Um, about 50 years later, Donald Stokes published a very important paper where he said, well, Bush had a good idea, but it's actually not the way things work. The process from research to development is neither linear, nor is it necessarily actually pure. And what he did was create a two by two matrix on a Cartesian plot of consideration for use versus quest for basic understanding or quest for knowledge. And to help us understand what this might, uh, what each of these quadrants might mean, or at least three out of the four of them, he named each quadrant for uh, a famous example. So in the lower right, where we have strong consideration of use, but very limited quest for basic understanding, we have Thomas Edison. In the upper left, we have Niels Bohr working on quantum mechanics, knowing that he's trying to solve fundamental problems of the universe and the atom, but not having any practical applications. 
And in the upper right, the 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 ideal that um, that Stokes was talking about was Louis Pasteur, where, as an example, in among the many things Pasteur did, he was looking to understand the nature of disease, but also knew that this tremendous societal impact that he hoped to have also was underpinned by extraordinary fundamental ignorance. And so always with his mind on that societal impact, he started to do the basic work. Now, one of the really neat things about Stokes um, analysis is that we can overlay his quadrants essentially over uh, what psychologists have said are cultural types within organizations, where we have down here in Edison quadrant, essentially a manufacturing company where there's a, a focus on what they manufacture. They make this stuff, they sell this stuff, and they don't pay much attention to what goes on outside that's going to change any of that. In an academic environment, you have the ability to bring in all sorts of new inputs to interact, but the targets are relatively um, flexible and, and vague. Whereas in Pasteur's quadrant, you have a technology uh, company where you're, you've got a focus, but you also know that your value chain is moving very quickly. The technology is evolving. You need to stay uh, infinitely connected in order to be successful. And, and people have asked me over the years, who's down here? Well, to be perfectly honest, it's kind of my uncle, Robert. Um, and I, I won't tell you what, what his uh, foibles were. Unfortunately, while those quadrants are nice and, um, and, and sound as described, where industry lives on the right-hand side, academia lives in the upper left, uh, things have been shifted. And what's begun to happen is that academia is now moving from the upper left into the upper right, into Pasteur's quadrant. That's not a bad thing. What starts making it bad is that as academia moves in, a lot of industry is starting to move out. And so we stop seeing the kinds of publications that we would normally get in Pasteur's quadrant from companies. And we begin to see the rise of uh, patenting as the dominant uh, means of communicating what's going on. There's an interesting um, a cartoon that I ran across a couple of months ago that of course, uh, Professor O'Hara will find particularly topical. <laughs> in which uh, a professor in his ivory tower, who is now working in Pasteur's quadrant says, why won't you use this brilliant catalyst that I've created? And the corporate leader down on the ground says, because your catalyst is gonna take 15 steps in order to manufacture, so I can't use it. So after investing all of this time, what is this professor to do? They're not gonna just toss it into the wind so the, the pressure then becomes to move from Pasteur's quadrant into Edison's quadrant as the professor. So now we start seeing academic labs that are beginning to do the kinds of things that we really needed and generally counted on the, uh, the, the corporate labs to do. And what that means is we are now moved into a world where the Freilich equation says we need to have high complementarity, but if we're doing, if both of us are doing the same job, then we are not able to overcome the barriers that really need to be overcome in order to be uh, more innovative. When we start making changes like that, growth becomes much, much harder because companies begin to focus more and more on their core. As I said, they're moving from Bastard's quadrant down into Edison's quadrant, they're looking at what they're manufacturing, they're focusing more on that and very small iterations around that. And they're comfortable with that because if we look at this study done by McKinsey based on a survey of corporate, corporate leaders over many years, what they discovered is that merely extending our product line has a fabulously high success rate and doesn't take very long to do. So what am I going to do if I wanna grow? Well, most companies, because they're comfortable here, and get a bit of hubris, say, well, I want to move up towards this shiny object. But look at the success rate there, which frankly, I think is uh, surveyed a little bit high. I would actually 
make that closer to 2% to 10% for success rate, moving into these areas of great um, technical and market uh, uncertainty where our familiarity is low on both dimensions. And the time to commercialization, which I actually think is quite accurate, tends to be somewhere averaging 14 to 20 years. So we're in a world where this is very, very difficult for a company that's used to being here to all of a sudden start moving here. And it tends to be a bad plan that drives you to spend a lot of stupid money. The way around that actually is to recognize that you have a built-in mechanism to reduce your uncertainties, both in market and in technology. And that is point number three, which is to build from your strengths. That reduces uncertainty because you always know at least you have one foot firmly planted in what you're doing and you can control the learning. But let's also be clear on what the definition of a strength is. Strength are those areas where a company has a clear competitive advantage in the market, where we know compared to our best of class competitor, we are the top. Now that's different from what you hear a lot of management consultants talk about which is core competencies. Competencies are thing a company does. Strengths are how a company differentiates. So if you think about that, I wanna build from my differentiation, making my differentiation stronger and dragging along with me those things that are uncertain and learning about them while I am still delivering based on my strengths. Now, I've looked at this for many years and I was hoping for a different answer, but I have found that there are only four categories of strength manufacturing, market access, technology, and brand. You don't need to be great in all of them, but you do need to be great in at least one of them in order to be able to grow. And while I've been singing this song for a number of years, um, I, I was actually fairly pleased based on some, some recent data that came out. First of all, we've known uh, for a couple of decades, <laughs> pardon me, that only 13% of corporate acquisitions anywhere in the world uh, return the cost of capital. This is Chris Zook's work from 2001. And that's a pretty low, uh, that's a pretty low number, pretty low success rate. Um, and largely it's because, as I said before, most companies move too far beyond their core knowledge. But what we found through a publication through Van Holzer uh, just about five months ago, it, looking at shareholder return across 770 companies from 2014 to 2019. No, I'm sorry, 2004 to 2019. He found that businesses that focus just on their core compared to their, um, uh, their peers and shareholder return actually return about 1% less than their peers. But those who try to go all the way into that world of uncertainty, actually take these great steps and do significantly worse than their peers. So clearly a different plan is required to grow effectively and to have disproportionate growth. Let's go back to this McKinsey uh, survey grid. And I suggest to you that what this actually shows us is that we need to have a foundation of strategy that says, I'm going to take small steps, building from my uh, strengths, but each one being a rational decision that I take knowing full well that I have one foot firmly planted in a reality. And that suggests that instead of moving from here to here, as we've shown before, that we actually move in this direction that we either build on our market, uh, or sorry, our technology strength and expand into new markets, or we build on our technology strengths, or, or sorry, our marketing strengths and expand into new technologies. And in the end, if we pursue this exquisitely throughout the whole, we will end up in the same place. So we can set this as a desire but we can't be attracted to the shiny object and dive in right away. Now we can complete Van Holzer's picture 
and show that for those companies that moved into adjacencies, which are the companies who are moving either vertically or horizontally, but not diagonally, what we find is that these companies outcompete their pair, their peers in shareholder value by about 3%. So this idea that we build from a strategy, that we build from our strengths is a critical one. And it's now been borne out through recent data. But I'll also show you a really interesting example that I lived for 33 years. This is the um, self-written history of DuPont where it started as a gunpowder business, ultimately expanded into explosives, then became a chemical and materials company, and then became a science and innovation company, which was sort of shorthand for materials plus biology. This is the external view. And I love this quote at the bottom from Fortune magazine, when they looked at uh, 27 companies that changed the world, uh, and this was probably 20 years ago that they did this. And they said, you can tell the story of the developed world through the materials that DuPont invented or commercialized. Now, who doesn't want to work for that company? And look at all of the things that came about. What brilliant innovations, what brilliant uh, minds must have led to this? Um, but that's the external view. Let me show you my interpretation of what it looked like from the inside. Yes, the company started in gunpowder. And if you're in the explosives business, when dynamite is invented and nitrocellulose is, is discovered, you get into that business as well. When you started doing the benzene chemistry that leads you to dynamite, you now have the foundation in order to be able to get into dyes and pigments. So market access gives us dynamite and explosive businesses, technology, uh, familiarity gives us dyes and pigments. But this also now leads to excellence in nitrogen chemistry derived from nitrocellulose. And we get into the world of polymers. In fact, DuPont commercialized the first and uh, to this day, some of the most important polymers, uh, neoprene, um, uh, nylon, a Kapton, Kevlar, Nomax, a whole string of different materials, which are all derived from our foundation that we got through explosives. And once we got into polymers, now we had technology to give us market access into imaging materials, into paints. Paints led to electronic materials through a bizarre uh, coincidence. Once we had nylon, we had to figure out what to do with it, which gave us fibers and once we had fibers, we figured out how to make biofibers. Now, this is a strange little turn here. In order to be in the dynamite business, we needed access to, to sulfuric acid. And we bought a sulfuric acid company, which then gave us lithopone, which is a white pigment, which got us into the titanium dioxide business and on and on. And I don't need to go ad nauseum into this. But you can see that each one of these was a small step using either our strength in market access or strength in technology. This is not the way the company thinks of itself. It prefers to think of itself like this. So I was often being asked by our board of directors, where's our next nylon coming from? Why isn't your team inventing the next nylon? I've used the word strategy a lot. Let me give you my perspective of what strategy is and what it isn't. Uh, first of all, it's not a haphazard process that involves a lot of platitudes. It's a plan to solve a critical strategic business challenge. It's a series of choices that we make on how we're going to solve that challenge. And when we make a choice, we also have to have clear understanding of what choices we aren't making. So a strategy is both the choices we make and a clear articulation of what we're not going to do and how we're going to help the customer win and how we're gonna win against the best of our competitors. What it isn't is equally important. It's not just long-term thinking. It's not a collection of projects that we're already doing. It's not things like vision statements, tactics, core values. Those are all important to have, but they don't combine into a strategy. 
nor do the financial goals and metrics that are the output desired from a strategy make the strategy itself. They're also not choices that allow us to merely participate. And I love this last one, which I did not develop. It, it came from a friend of mine who said that you can always tell a bad strategy when you look at the converse of the statement and it's absurd. So as an example, I would like profitable growth. Well, let's look at the converse. I'd like profitable shrinkage. No, that doesn't seem like a good plan. Or I'd like unprofitable growth. Well, that's a bad plan. So clearly that statement cannot be a strategy because it doesn't represent a viable choice. One of the key things in being able to develop a strategy that makes good sense is to also recognize that if you ask yourself the standard questions, the standard question being, I'm over here, I want to be over here, so how do I grow? That's exactly the same question that your competitor is asking. And when you ask the same question, you're likely to give the same answers, which means you're going to be in a dogfight. But if we use our stupid money avoidance criteria, we can ask different questions. For instance, we can ask the question, are what are the critical strengths that give me the right to beat my competition? And once I've established that, I now can begin to see differentiated opportunities. When I ask what fundamentally limits my growth, not how do I grow, but what are the limitations, then I can start finding these adjacencies. I can begin to define innovative new business definitions and new ways of delivering answers. So what this is saying is that a strategy should be a way of differentiating. Differentiating builds on our strengths and the ability to differentiate builds on innovation potential through acquisition of new information. Well, that brings me to the, to the last of these lessons that I so painfully learned, which is while differentiating is important, everything that has ever been produced and introduced into the market is replacing something that is already in that role. And one of the uh, parlor games that I play every time I go to a new organization is to ask people to give me an example, just one example of something that new that did not replace something old, something already doing the work. And just by way of example, we have, how, how do we chop down trees? Well, 2 million years ago, we had a hand axe. Uh, 3,000 years ago, we had a socketed axe. Uh, then uh, about 200 years ago, we got the first chainsaw. Uh, and just to make you squirm a little bit, please know that in 1930, the chainsaw was patented as a surgical instrument. Clearly, we've moved on. Hopefully, we've moved on. And today, we have these extraordinarily creepy, robotically controlled devices that chop down the tree through measuring its diameter and its height, know how many board feet you can get out of it through optical trimming, and are able to drop it in a way that it does limited damage to the rest of the trees in the forest. Fabulous, but in the end, each one of these devices replaced something that existed already to do the job. You can only replace an incumbent with a compelling value proposition versus the next best alternative. That is the other thing that's there or the other thing that you know that is being developed by your competition. There's an interesting piece of data uh, created by Cooper and Kleinschmidt by looking at all of the failures of a market introduction of new things. And to summarize these data, I put it in terms of recognizing that when we're moving into a new area, we don't know what we don't know. And if you don't know what you don't know, you're going to be spending a lot of stupid money. What Cooper and Kleinschmidt found was that the failure modes surprisingly have very little to do with invention. They have very little to do with the technology. What they have to do with is we didn't know what the market needed. And because either our market analysis or our market design, our product design or our marketing or our high 
uh, the cost we were shooting for, what the competition was doing, when we needed to come forward, we weren't actually inventing the right thing or we weren't marketing the thing the way we needed to. So when you combine these data along with the other category that I um, generously say is 50% having to do with technology, essentially 87% of the failures are because of poor market understanding. What that means is that we didn't do the upfront work up front, curiously enough, and we didn't define a viable value proposition. So how do we have to get a value? How do we get a value proposition? Well, value propositions are those uh, assumptions that we test that ultimately should allow the company to win versus the com competition while still making something that the, that the market wants to buy. Allowing to make clear the difference between a value proposition and value capture. For years, I would talk to people about value, uh, value propositions, and they would talk to me about how much money they would make in their business. That's value capture. Value proposition is how you're going to influence the customer to buy what you're developing. So technically, at the beginning, a value proposition is a set of assumptions that need to be tested. So let's let's build one. Um, we've got the time. So we start with where are we today? What's the basic competitive value that's being developed or being delivered in the market? And we have an idea to do something better. It's differentiated. It adds more value. A lot of people like to stop there and say, that's my value proposition. Well, not so fast. Because remember, we're replacing something that's already there. And that means that there's going to be a negative value for doing something new. None of us really are that excited to change what has been working for a long time. So there's a negative differential value. Then we have to honestly say that this is the net economic value that we deliver with our value proposition. Except that's not really true either. It's actually this difference, which is a whole lot smaller. So when somebody talks about having a great value proposition, we have to both know exactly what the value is that's being delivered by today's entry into the market and how our net economic value is going to be versus that value that exists today. But this is also where stupid money starts getting spent, even if I've gone this far and I can define this because I also now have to capture some of the value, but I have to leave enough for uh, my customer, which means in the end, this is all I get. So whatever value I deliver, whatever innovation I develop, you know, regardless of what my value proposition is, it has to leave enough for both me and my customers and the value chain as a whole to win. The nice thing is that once you have defined this value proposition, it gives you a set of assumptions, financial, technical, that make up this value proposition. This then leads to a great roadmap for an R&D agenda. And it can also enable you to produce an intellectual property roadmap that this is what I have to be able to develop. These are the patents. This is the technology. These are the partners, all of this. And it can give you a forewarning of stupid money ahead because when these assumptions turn out to be false, the stench of death could be laying very heavy over this value proposition. And maybe that is the way of knowing that stupid money smells pretty bad and you should stop. You can stop a whole lot earlier if that is the case. So let me close by just reiterating what 33 years of making hideous corporate mistakes have taught me. Again, innovation is different from invention. Innovation can only be measured through successful market introduction and sustainability within the market. It can come from anywhere. It doesn't have to come through invention. And there's some wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, ideas, wonderful innovations, some of which we have in our pocket and on our desk that actually come from that. Invention requires the acquisition of new information. Sorry, innovation requires the acquisition of new information in order to get started. Your culture has to be right 
in order for that to happen. And if you don't have that right culture, um, it's going to be very, very difficult because that culture addresses the Freilich equation factors. You succeed more when you innovate from your strengths. Strengths are your differentiated positives. Those are things that nobody else can do and they can't be bought on the outside. And they're essentially your license to win. They also help you form a strategic foundation on which to innovate. A good strategy helps solve your problems and it provides the answers to the right questions that, that define the limits to spending stupid money. And those limits actually help enhance creativity. And finally, as I just said, every product replaces something that already exists. Without that powerful value proposition, in addition to having that value capture mechanism, you're basically going to be spending a lot of stupid money. Understanding all five of these factors is gonna be a, a big help in reducing wasted money, setting a research agenda that actually looks powerful, and knowing when you should start and stop things. And now it is time to stop this. So let me open for questions that you can put into the Q&A chat box. I want to stop sharing, Steve. We'll... Yeah, yeah so Steve said uh, he's very uh, keen to hear about your queries or questions on what he's just said. Um, the chat function is uh, is not working uh, in this uh, online use the Q&A function, and I've got it here to uh, to line up and prioritize and so on. You can upvote some questions, I believe, if you like at the sound of them. And um, uh, and but let me begin, uh, Steve. So uh, that was wonderful. Um, Thank you. Obviously. Uh, I come from a different world, um, and you're in my world this year. Um, and so uh, do corporates spend stupid money in universities? Yes. Um, it's actually a great question, and, and I've been thinking about this in preparation uh, for the charts. Um, when I depend on a university to swing from my core into that upper right quadrant, where my knowledge base is low both in technology and market, I seriously run the risk of hoping that the university answers, reduces all of my uncertainties. I have to know what uncertainties the university is capable of resolving and which ones I need to resolve so that we can work together with this complementarity of, of collaboration to drive the uncertainties down together. So the university would be largely, in, in our words, mm -hmm. it would largely be reducing technical uncertainties. But I have to understand the value proposition that I'm hoping to get. I can't say, I'd like you to invent something in biology. When you get there, go tell me, and I'll look at it and designate it as good or not good. And, and this, this becomes the problem. Now, the nice thing about the, that two by two matrix uh, from McKinsey is that reducing market uncertainty is actually cheap and easy. I can talk to people, I can buy studies, I can talk to value chain uh, leaders, I can hire consultants for a couple hundred thousand dollars, I can reduce my market uncertainty relatively well. Once I have that reduced, then I can provide some better direction on what academia should do in order to help me not spend stupid money. Is, is that yeah reasonably yeah, clear? I, I wish people would do that more, perhaps from, from my experience. But uh, that's for another well, another time. I would argue that's why I'm here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, the top question at the minute is from uh, Boris. Uh, if tech is responsible for a surprisingly small percentage of failure, what percentage is it responsible in the case of successful innovation? Wow. Um, as a tech guy, the answer is 100%. Uh, I made that up and I apologize in advance. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that because if you think about innovation as coming from a number of different functions, uh, let, let's look, for instance, at, um, at the, the, um, the iPod. Those of you who are old enough to remember the iPod. 
The iPod was not the best MP3 player when it was introduced. There was nothing new about its technology. The thing that really differentiated the iPod was the business model, and to a lesser extent, the legal model that did this. And so there is a success that is a smashing success and ultimately led to the iPhone. Um, but it was not technology-based. It had some technology in it just because Apple likes to be a little bit whiz-bang. But from the foundational technology, the MP3 player, the iPod was nothing special. So I haven't been able to give you a quantified answer, but I think as you go and look through examples of things that you see as innovations, you'll see many of them are as much about how they were marketed, how they were positioned, how the value chain addressed them, that there are many that we are comfortable with and familiar with that have very little to do with technology or where the technology is sufficiently old that the patents had long since run out and the innovation actually happened later in time through value chain solutions. Thank you. Um, uh, Robin's interested uh, in your McKinsey plot and has a question uh, relating to that. Uh, isn't moving from Pasteur to Edison quadrants effectively productization developing economies of scale after the initial idea has been proved commercially? Yes, that's perfectly reasonable. And that's the way industry uh, basic research labs function where they, or how they used to function when they were in, in prominence, they would have a fundamental problem of societal interest. We want to substitute natural fibers for man-made fibers, for instance, but we have no idea what a polymer is. I mean, literally when that work was done, there was an open question of whether polymers were single molecules, collections of molecules, or bizarre aggregates of molecules. And that, that fundamental ignorance towards a foundational uh, societal problem needed to, be, uh, needed to be addressed. But once it got addressed, you could then begin to form Edison quadrant type of, uh, of models where you create businesses, one to develop nylon and to figure out how to manufacture it at scale, one for neoprene, one for Kevlar, one for Nomex, et cetera. And once those models, those businesses become established, now you can start jumping from, um, from the two by two matrix of Donald Stokes Pasteur uh, model to now saying this becomes my core. You now jump over to the McKinsey two by two matrix where your core allows you to say, take nylon from a fiber in materials, or sorry, a fiber in clothing to an engineering polymer in automobiles but you're still staying within that, uh, that same strength of your core, just changing the market with the same technology. Or to say, now that I know about fibers, I want a fiber that is as strong as steel, and out of that comes Kevlar. Thank you. Um, here's one from Jonathan. Uh, any evidence of different propensities to spend stupid money between privately owned and publicly quoted companies? Ah, uh, brilliant, brilliant question. <laughs> um, you'll notice if you, if you dig into the uh, references here that these companies are generally, I, I think it's almost exclusively um, publicly held because they publish the information they're they're available uh, to be able to do the comparisons, and their publicly uh, uh, shown data are are generally all in the same format. So the the researchers can figure out what goes on. Um, privately held companies tend to have a much longer runway for their research, uh, depending upon which generation is running the company. Uh, one of the things that we'll talk about in the spring is the change that happened in DuPont, where the board of directors stopped being dominantly held by, or dominantly uh, uh, captured by people who were long-term DuPont family members and started opening up to, to others. So even though it was publicly traded, it was still mostly under the control of the family. Um, 
And when, when it opened up to the outside, a lot of the innovation potential of the company dissipated because there was more stupid money that started to be spent as quarterly earnings became more important. And we started impacting the ability to innovate accordingly. Yeah, good one. Uh, Barney, who started off the Q&A, I think we should go back to him. I've been jumping up and down the list. Uh, he would like to have a further explanation of negative differential. Yeah, good, good thing because it's it's not a common it's not a common thought. Um, some of it can be as simple as I'm friends with the salesman for the competitor. Some of it can be that the competition provides me with um, the product in a form that I can just drop right into my machine and use it as is. I don't have to change a thing. Some of it can be really simple, like your product is 10% more expensive, even though it delivers ultimately higher value. One of the more interesting people I ever worked with was a, uh, a Swedish paper company. And this person was both their chief technology officer and their vice president of sales. He was the only person I ever dealt with, and this is a major international company, who knew the value of both the pricing and the value of the technology. But usually those jobs are separated and you find that there's a negative differential value from somebody in the company who is a decision. Yeah. So uh, quite a few uh, of you uh, would like to know uh, Steve's view on the differences between research in a corporate environment and at universities. They should be different. Uh, if we go to the Donald Stokes model again and, and look at the difference between even a Pasteur quadrant versus a Bohr quadrant, where Bohr is the traditional role of the university. Pasteur would be the traditional role of a uh, highly developed industrial lab. Um, there should be some differentiation. Now, there was a, a really, really interesting study that was published a couple of years ago where somebody said, yeah, but academia has always worked in Pasteur's quadrant. So let's look at what happens when we have both industry and academia doing ostensibly the same things in Pasteur's quadrant. And the results are fascinating. And they, they are in part indicative of this culture change that I described early in the presentation. What you find is that while the work is going on with the same societal, societal objectives, and to a certain extent, progressing along the same lines, because everybody's going to the same conferences, what you find is that the output from academia is publications, almost exclusive. And the output from industry is almost exclusively patents. Same work, same goals, same quadrant, different outputs. So to Dermot's initial question, is there stupid money in collaboration with academia? Well, it can be if I expect your output to be the same as mine. If I expect you not to publish and instead allow me to patent, I've got to have all of that very clear up front. Now, there are other re reasons why industrial research is, is uh, prosecuted differently from academia. academia. Industry has to sing for its supper, but it doesn't have to do it on a, necessarily on an annual basis. I don't need to get grant money to get something done. I need to have a compelling argument about how it's going to help the company. And I could have millions of dollars thrown by. I also have the ability to have people work on something, the same people work on something for 20 years, have the same team together doing that. Whereas in academia, I'm turning my students over and every new student who comes in has to be re-educated. So there, there are a lot of things that are different, but let's also be clear that um, extraordinarily good people reside in both organizations and um, we shouldn't try to draw a line to say the brilliant people are all in academia and the slogging people are all in industry or vice versa. There's brilliance everywhere I've ever been.
Yeah, it should be synergistic, shouldn't it? And yeah. constructive rather than destructive. Um, and I think that feeds on nicely to David's question. He wants your uh, your thoughts on, on the following. Um, if businesses are driving for ever shorter returns, uh, is that in one part, uh, one of the drivers reduction in real innovation? Uh, you know, i.e. do these things take... Uh, Need enough time to develop knowledge sharing to come up with true innovation. Yes, that's that's the short answer. The longer answer is that if you think about that that uh, uh, nine to uh, eighteen year time period that a an innovation requires to go to market, um, if you're in a world of of uncertain technology and uncertain markets, which means you're basically creating something new for your company. You're well outside the comfort zone for quarterly earnings statements. And so there is a tendency to start slicing the research that's going in that direction. And what you find generally is that corporate research labs will not kill projects like that. They'll just maim them. They'll make them so they are sufficiently small that nobody cares about them. And everybody likes uh, the, the statement of what's going to be delivered, but you're just not putting enough people in it to make it real on a time scale that's rational. So in the end, you're fundamentally spending stupid money through a short-term perspective. Right. Well, um, how are you doing? You all right to have one more right. question? I'm yeah, right. it looks like we Twitter's may, late, so we may give uh, uh, Jules the, uh, the last question I can see here. Uh, on building from uh, your strengths, you mentioned it's your competitive advantage. If this changes over time, perhaps decreases, should you adjust based on knowing, observing this, or would you stick to your historic biggest advantage? Not changing with the reality of the markets is um, like putting a stupid money hole in your pocket. Um, you know, it, it's like the, the, old, the old joke about the company that develops laser-guided buggy whips. Um, the buggy whip market is gone. Uh, putting a laser on it isn't going to help much. Uh, and, and the same thing happens for each one of your strengths. If you used to have market access, let's say you're a company in Southeast Asia and you have market access in, in Vietnam and China decides they wanted to take over the Vietnamese market and you couldn't compete with them, you can no longer say that your market access in Vietnam is the best of anybody. So each one of these has to be evaluated on an ongoing basis. And I will tell you that um, DuPont used to be very proud of the fact that they claim to have 27 uh, differentiated strengths. And when I started categorizing them into these four areas, I generally got to the point where maybe there were five out of that 27 that were still sound within that categorization. Um, and so it's it's a danger, it's a risk, and it's one of the things that uh, business and corporate leaders need to be honest with their uh, senior leadership about so we don't end up opening that hole in the pocket. Are you all right for a few more? I've suddenly got a flush of new uh, questions. In fact, somebody has just asked a question you may know, Philip Boydell. Why, Philip, how are you? <laughs> Uh, who we both know very well for for different reasons. Uh, he says, hi, Steve. So there you go. Uh, you evidenced mostly the tangible world. Do the shorter development cycle times of software-based innovations lead to different conclusions? Um, I haven't studied software. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a characteristically good question, Philip. Um, let, me, let me think about this for a minute. I, in, in general, Yes, I think the same rules would apply with some caveats. First of all, the development time is dramatically short. Uh, if, you, if you were working on the same software for 15 years, chances are a whole lot has passed you by. That's 15 years without introduction to be able to test prototypes in the market and know what's going on. Um, but in the end, there's still a kernel of uh, differentiated technology whether that's in terms of graphics or speed or, or user interface, there is still uh, a piece of the ability to distribute it uh, somehow, which could be a piece of, of, um, of, of market access. 
Manufacturing, however, I suspect, unless there's an interface of the software with hardware that's uh, somehow unique, probably is not going to be an area of strength. And brand, I don't think there'd be any question that brand is a key portion of the strengths of software. Now, what, what ends up changing all of this, I think, to a certain extent, is VC imp um, imposition into the software world, where VC can create buzz that is very, VC investment can create buzz that's very, very different than something you can have in, in a little bit more of the hard-boiled world of, of materials, chemicals, and, and general manufacturing. Um, happy to discuss this with you at some other time if you think I'm wrong, but I'm not a software guy. So this was the seat of the pants answer. You know, you know where he is, Philip, um, if you want to follow up. Exactly. Um, oh, we've got two here, but I think we could kind of probably merge them into a, a composite. So they both, uh, so one's uh, from Boris, what recommendations would you have for government to encourage non-stupid uh, innovation? And Ian, is more money spent in the public versus private uh, sector? So I'm sorry, is, is more money... Is is more stupid money spent in in public or private sectors? I, I can't answer the last one. Uh, it's a great question, and, and I'm going to look into how to figure out how to do that. But as I said before, in um, sorry, I, I'm I'm thinking about public and private different. Yeah. You're you're asking uh, presumably, do governments spend more stupid money? Mm, yeah, uh, yeah, you could take it as that. Yeah, yeah. Well. That's politics, and I can't get into that. <laughs> um, but I do think it's a it's a valid question to ask about public private partnerships and how they can lead to uh, either stupid money because politics are leading the the public strategy, and how they can lead to actually reducing the timeline and dramatically increasing the success probability of a public-private relationship to get something into the market that would otherwise be extraordinarily difficult. If you want the classic example, it's the Manhattan Project, which was the ultimate public-private uh, partnership where the goal was clear, the science was good enough to get going on, and every company that was needed threw whatever they had to, to throw into it to address how to get this done. And the whole war effort was that way. And coming out of that comes a, an industry where, uh, or a series of industries in, the, in def the defense industry that depend on the public, uh, pardon my editorializing, but the public trough in order to take basic science and drive it into new technology towards an unfortunate uh, ultimate application. Um, how much money there gets wasted well, you, know, you can argue about the $400 ashtray, but how much of that really is that it's money that needs to be spent in order to make up for something unique in the ashtray that we don't accept, that we don't know about, or um, money that was spent because it had to be billed to an ashtray when something else failed? That's a long babbling answer that gets to the point that I will leave it to the various governments to define how much public money gets wasted. But I also suspect that that is uh, a, as much a political as it is a financial and business decision. Okay. Well, I, I think maybe we'll leave it at that, uh, as you say. Well, um, uh, thank you from myself. And on your behalf, I will uh, thank Steve, if you allow me, uh, hopefully for giving you a very thought-provoking uh, lecture this evening. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for inviting me. Good night. Take care, everybody. Take care.